So this morning uh, is the third week in the sermon series I'm doing entitled Masterclass Storyteller, looking at the parables of Jesus, the stories that he told, and what we can learn from them about what it means to know God. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the term parable, the best definition that I have found is by the pastor John MacArthur. He defined parable as an ingeniously simple word picture illuminating a profound spiritual lesson. An ingeniously simple word picture illuminating a profound spiritual lesson. Think of Jesus saying that the kingdom of God is like a seed or God is like a father welcoming home a wayward son. He takes these pictures and tells a story in a way that illuminates a profound spiritual lesson. And by using everyday language, he was, allowed, he was able to connect with his audience in a way that they'd remember what he taught better than you might remember me when I, when I uh, share, um, you know, using direct teaching. But also he taught in such a way that it caused those who thought they were all sophisticated, those who were self-righteous to dismiss Jesus as basic, as his teaching, as just basic teaching, while those who were childlike in their faith responded to Jesus. It was this ingenious way of teaching that separated those who had childlike faith from those who thought they were all self-righteous. So this morning, we're going to be looking at the parable of the workers in the vineyard, which is found in Matthew chapter 20. So if you have a Bible, you can open up to Matthew 20. Otherwise, as long as the slides are working, we will be putting them up um, for you to follow along. Let me give a quick context to Matthew 20. Um, before he tells this parable, what has happened in Matthew 19 is uh, a, a few things that show clearly how the values of the kingdom of God are, are significantly different than the values of this world. First, you have children coming to Jesus, and the disciples are saying, you know, get these children away. They're of no consequences. But Jesus says, let the children come to me. In fact, he says, the kingdom of God belongs to to those who come with this kind of childlike faith. So he elevates these children who they thought were of no consequence, and he says, no, the kingdom of God belongs to people like this. And then after that, we have a rich young ruler coming to Jesus saying, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And after Jesus has a little back and forth, he tells him, go sell all you own, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And the rich young ruler goes away sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus says how hard it is for the rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And you see this, again, how the values of the kingdom of heaven are not like the values of this world, where Jesus is welcoming a child who has nothing to offer, and turning away this rich young ruler has so much to offer. It's so different than the way the world works. And in response to this, Peter says to Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Great question, right? He's saying basically like, What's in it for us? We've sacrificed so much. What reward do we get? What's in it for us? And Jesus says to him, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me also will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. So again, Peter watches what's going on, and he asks, basically, what's in it for us? Like, we've given up so much to follow you. What is going to be in it for us? And Jesus says, don't worry. You know, when you are in heaven, you will have a hundred times anything that you've given up. There's nothing that you can give up or sacrifice that you will not receive back a hundredfold in eternal life. But then, I think he, he kind of diagnoses the heart of Peter's question. And in response to Peter's question, what's in it for us? What's our reward for following you? He tells this parable, the parable of the workers in the vineyard. So I'm going to go through this parable a little at a time. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. Let's read the first two verses. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. So let me stop there. So Jesus goes on to answer Peter's question to compare the kingdom of God, the reign of God, to a landowner hiring workers to work in his vineyard. 
Now, it's very important. A parable is not the same as an allegory, just to, again, make sure they got the genres correct here. An allegory is where everything symbolizes something else. Think of Pilgrim's Progress, if you've ever read that. Everything symbolizes something else. A parable really focuses on a main lesson, a main point, but you don't read too much into every symbols and try to figure out what every symbol, you know, everything means. But he just says, basically, the kingdom of God is like a landowner hiring workers to work in the vineyard. And he hires some of them early in the morning, and he agrees to pay them a denarius. And that's an important detail in the story. A denarius was a silver coin. It was basically kind of a day's living wage for people like soldiers. Those who had jobs would be paid a denarius a day. The day laborers that he's hiring here received significantly less than a denarius because they were the men who'd be out in the marketplace waiting to be hired. They were unemployed men hoping someone would hire them to work for the day. They were in need. They did not have much negotiating power because there were many people who wanted to be hired. And so they were usually paid significantly less than a day's wage, significantly less than a denarius. And so essentially, Jesus is telling a parable where the landowner gives very generously to the day laborers that he is hiring them. They're getting more than the typical day laborer would receive. So let me continue verses three through seven. About the third hour, he went out and he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the 11th hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. And he said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. If you're unfamiliar with the terms third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour, 11th hour, the Jewish day went from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And so the third hour was he went back out at 9 a.m. and hired some more. Six hour would have been 12 p.m. He went out at noon, hired some more workers, and then he went out at 3 p.m. And then again at 5 p.m., one hour before the end of the day, and hired some more workers to come and work in his vineyard. So then let's finish or continue in verse 8. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour came and each received a denarius. So when those who came, so when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Did you catch what happened there? So he's hired some early in the morning, some at 9, 12, 3, 5 o'clock. And then at the end of the day, he brings those who are hired at 5 o'clock and work for one hour, and he gives them a denarius. And so those who were hired first are like, this is amazing. If they were hired and work one hour and were given a denarius, surely we're going to be given more. But then when they come, they also receive a denarius. And so they begin to grumble against the landowner. This is unfair. They worked for one hour and they got paid a denarius. We worked the whole day long in the heat of the day and we also got a denarius. This is so unfair. And the landowner says, don't I have the right to be generous? Don't I have the right to do what I want with my money? And then he ends by saying the last thing he has said to Peter, the last will be first and the first will be last. The point seems to be this. Like if you had to summarize it, you know, in a sentence, what Jesus seems to be communicating is this. It doesn't matter when in life that you are saved, each one receives eternal life. It doesn't matter if you came to faith as a five-year-old early in your life, as an 18-year-old, a 38-year-old, 58-year-old, or on your deathbed like the thief on the cross next to Jesus saying, Father, you know, saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into my kingdom, into your kingdom, and he is saved. It seems to be Jesus is making this point, right? It doesn't matter when you're saved. It doesn't matter when you come to faith in Jesus. Each one receives eternal life. So why doesn't Jesus just say this? If this seems to be the point, 
again, why doesn't Jesus just come out and, and say this sentence? Why does he use a parable? Why does he tell this story that can be so easily misunderstood? What's the point, again, of speaking in parable form? This is my guess. I think that one of the qualities of the parable is that because it sounds like an everyday story, it kind of has a way of getting past your defenses, sneaking past people's defenses, and then revealing the attitudes that people have in their heart. You think you're just listening to a story, and you react emotionally to it, and by reacting emotionally, it reveals something about yourself, something about your own heart, something about your understanding of God, of yourself, of the way faith should work. Think about Nathan. Think about back maybe if you remember the story of Nathan confronting David after he committed adultery with Bathsheba. He doesn't just come out and say, I know what you did. Instead, he tells him a story about someone who owned a lamb and, and how the, the, the other you know, man who owned a lot of sheep stole that man's lamb to feed someone and how it gets David upset. He says, that's wrong. This person should be punished. And then Nathan says this, you are that man. Right? He tells a parable to David in a way that sneaks past his defenses and reveals the attitude of David's heart. And so I think that's what, what's happening here. And I just want to use this parable like a mirror this morning to your heart. That as the story was told, I think it reveals some things about our hearts. Three things in particular that I want to focus on this morning. The first thing I think this parable reveals is our attitude towards salvation. This parable reveals our attitude towards salvation. When I use the word salvation, I'm referring to the essential message of the Christian faith, the message of Jesus, the gospel, the good news, which starts with the bad news that we are all separated by our sin, by everything we've done wrong from a holy God. And we are headed to eternal separation from that holy God. But the good news is that God loved us so much that he would not let us die in our sins, but he sent his son Jesus to live the perfect life that we could not live, to die a sacrificial death on the cross in our place, to rise again from the dead, conquering sin and death, so that all who repent, who turn from their sins and self-centered ways and put their faith in Jesus, recognize that he died for you, will have eternal life, will be forgiven. As it says in John three sixteen to 18, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Pretty clear there that that's the gospel, the good news that God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for us. But whoever rejects him, whoever does not believe in him, it says, stands condemned. There's still under the wrath of God. So in this parable that Jesus tells, the workers were going to go hungry. They're standing out in the marketplace unemployed, and they're going to go hungry unless they're hired. And the landowner chooses to hire some of them to work. And some work a full day, some work part of the day, some only work one hour. But each one is given a denarius, more than enough to live on. Now consider the parable. Consider the parallel to our lives. No one is born a believer. No one is born right with God. Some come to faith in Jesus as five-year-olds. Some come as 18-year-olds. Some come middle-aged. Some come later in life. And some, again, like the thief on the cross, on their deathbed, turn to faith in Jesus. But each one receives eternal life. Each one who turns to faith in Jesus receives eternal life, forgiveness of sins, entry into heaven, a right relationship with God. How does that make you feel? As I hold up this mirror to you, how does it make you feel? Some of you sitting out here may have come to faith early in your life and been following God like those who were hired in the beginning of the day and been following God your whole life. And if that's you, are you offended in any way by God's grace that he shows towards those who come to faith later in life? When you read the story of the thief on the cross, you say, wait a minute. All he needed to do was at the end of his life, just say, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom and he's saved. Are you offended by God's grace, by the way that they also receive eternal life? Do you feel like you deserve more reward because you've been serving longer, because you've been following God longer than those who come later in life? 
And if so, what does that reveal about your understanding of salvation, your understanding of the gospel? If in any way we find ourselves bitter and resentful or envious of those who come later in life, it reveals that there's something we're not understanding about the gospel. I think it shows that we believe in some way that we earn our salvation or we deserve reward. That we've earned our salvation and we deserve our reward. But if we realize that it's a complete undeserved gift, that like those laborers, we were out there unemployed, heading for eternal separation from God, but that he chose us, he hired us, so to speak, he brought us in. If we realize that it's all an undeserved gift, then we have no basis from which to be bitter, envious, angry, because it's all a gift. As it says in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, Paul writes, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Grace, an undeserved gift given by an unobligated giver, that we deserve nothing and God owed us nothing, but that he saved us when we put our faith in him. Not by anything we've done, not by our works, nothing that we've done to earn it, nothing that we deserve but it's complete grace. And so when we truly understand the gospel, we know that bitterness and envy, any of that is just incongruent. It doesn't line up with the gospel, with salvation by grace through faith. So I think that's one of the first things that happens. He tells the story in such a way that it sneaks past people's defenses and it reveals their attitude towards salvation. It's gonna bring to some people's hearts and minds, hey, wait a minute, this is unfair. I've worked longer. I've been following you longer. I deserve more reward. How come they get the same that I get? It reveals our attitude towards salvation. But salvation is a gift and nothing is earned. The second thing I think it reveals, it reveals our attitude towards the life of faith. Verse 12 says, these men who were hired last worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work, and the heat of the day. So they saw it as unfair. We have been working hard since the moment the sun came up and you gave us a denarius. And these have been sitting around unemployed and they came and worked for one hour and they also received the denarius. So I think, again, this parable is told in such a way that it sneaks past our defenses and it reveals not only our attitude towards salvation, but also our attitude towards the life of faith. Some of you look at your discipleship following Jesus and you feel like it's bearing the burden of the work and the heat of the day. You've been sacrificing for so long, following Jesus, saying no to the things of this world, living on the narrow path. And then there's others who've been living it up and doing whatever they please. And they also get forgiven. They also receive eternal life. How is that fair? They've just got to go off and do whatever they want. And then because they ask for forgiveness, they're forgiven. While we, you know, work so hard to say no to those things and live a godly, holy life. And somehow they are receiving eternal life the same way that we are. Again, this reveals our attitude towards a life of faith. Think about it another way. What if God came to you and said, you are going to die on July 19th 2025. You are going to die five years from today. How would you live your life? I can think of two poles to that answer, to to answer that question. On one end, you say, okay, I am going to go and I'm going to live it up and I am going to enjoy the pleasures of this world. And then on July 18th, 2025, I'm going to repent. And I'm going to confess my sins and I'm going to say, Lord, forgive me for how I lived. Please receive me into your kingdom. On the other end, you might say, I have five years to give my all to you, Lord, and to serve you with everything that I have because now I know my days are numbered and I want to make sure that I have shared the gospel with as many people in my life as humanly possible that I've left it all on the field, so to speak, for you. So again, when I said you've got five years to live, what went through your head? What went through your heart? Was it closer to this end? Saying, well, 
all right, well, now I know the date I need to repent of my sins and confess, and I'm just going to live it up until then. Or was it more of a reaction of, God, I want to give myself fully to you until the day I die? So again, what is this parable? What does that question reveal about your heart, about your attitude towards the life of faith? In other words, do you see life, the life of faith as a privilege, as something that you are so grateful that you are a part of, that you are part of God's kingdom, that you are following him, and it's the greatest privilege and joy of your life? Or do you see it as a chore? I guess I got to do that. If I don't want to go to hell, I guess I better follow. I I guess I better do these things. Do you see life to the full as connected to knowing and serving God, or do you see life to the full as living apart from him and doing whatever it is you want to do? Again, Jesus doesn't just come out and speak a sentence, you know, well, eternal life is the same for everyone. doesn't matter when you come to faith. He tells this parable, the story in a way that gets past our defenses and reveals the attitudes of our heart, our attitude towards salvation. Is it something we've earned, something we deserve? Or is it a completely free gift of God? Or what's our attitude towards the life of faith? Is it, this is a blessing that I've been able to work in the vineyard, so to speak, for the master the whole day, my whole life. What a blessing, what a privilege it has been. What a joy. Or, oh, it's felt like the burden, you know? It's felt like working in the heat of the day, and I wish I could have been, just living it up for 11 hours and then being being saved on that last day. Does this resonate with you at all? Are you envious of those who are not following, who just get to do whatever it is that they want, who might come to faith later in their life? Remember what Jesus said in John 10.10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. If you found yourself further on this end of the pole, right? If you were closer to this saying, man, if I knew I was going to die in five years, I would just live it up and then repent on the last day. Then you don't know the landowner very well. You don't know God very well. There's something you are missing out on, something you have not understood about this. So what Jesus says, that I've come that you might have life to the fullest, that the fullest life is not found in rejecting me and doing whatever it is that you want. It's found in living as close to me as possible and following me and knowing me and serving me. That is where life to the fullest is found. If you are further on this end, then there's something missing in your heart that you don't know how good God is or you've forgotten how good he is. You don't know that sin leads to death that choosing to live apart from God is like cutting yourself off from oxygen, from what you need to have life. You don't know that the things of this world are just going to be burned up in the end. They're not going to last. They're not going to matter. Only what is done in the name of Jesus will last forever. I know that those who come to faith later in their life often and usually look back and they're like, oh, they regret how they live. They regret so much and they wish and they envy those who came to faith earlier in their life. Oh, you've known God for so long. If only that had been my experience. I wasted so much time and made such a mess of things until God chose me and saved me. So again, this parable reveals our attitude towards the life of faith. Do you envy the 11th hour worker? The one who came to faith later in life? Or do you recognize it's the one who came to God in the first hour, who was saved in the beginning, who was chosen in the beginning? That's the one who is truly blessed. The third thing that this parable reveals is, oops, excuse me, it reveals our attitude towards God. Let me just read again, verse 9 to 15. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour came and each received the denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received the denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money or are you envious because I am generous? So those who work the full day grumble against the landowner and say, you are unfair. You're unfair. 
And this parable in this way reveals something in our hearts about how we feel about God and whether he is unfair or not. I mean, they forget that the landowner was generous to them. He gave them a denarius, which is more than any day laborer would ever get. As soon as they took their eyes off of that, put their eyes on someone else and said, well, what about him? How come he got more than I did? They've forgotten how generous the landowner was and they accuse him of being unfair. Do you understand? Are you seeing the parallel here? That as soon as they took their eyes off the landowner and what he gave them and the denarius and how they received more than they deserved and they put their eyes on someone else and said, well, how come they got more than I did? They stop becoming grateful and they start becoming un just envious. They think he's unfair now. Do you think God owes you the way that those workers did? Do you live your life thinking that if you are good, if you obey, then somehow God owes you blessing? Do you get resentful if God does not answer your prayers? Because you say, I've been good. How come you haven't answered my prayers? I've been following you. How come you haven't come through? Do you grumble against God when others who haven't been half as faithful as you receive incredible blessing? Or they're healed when you're seemingly overlooked? You spend your mornings in prayer every morning and still you're single. Still God hasn't brought someone into your life. You serve in church and someone else gets healed and you don't. This parable is told in such a way that it reveals our attitude of our hearts. Do we see God as unjust and unfair? That we've forgotten the graciousness, the generosity of God. And instead, we look around and we say, you're unfair, God. We think, this reveals that many of us think God owes us for our faithfulness or our goodness. But the truth is that God owes us nothing. He owes us nothing. God is no man's debtor. We can't put him under obligation to us because we've done something to us, for him. Everything, everything is pure grace. It's generosity. It's a gift of God. This is how Jesus put it in Luke chapter 17, verses 7 through 10. He said, suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Would he not rather say, prepare my supper? Get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Again, this parable right here is told in such a way that it gets past your defenses and it either makes you angry. What? We're God's slaves? kind of a God is this? Or it causes gratitude to well up within you. And you say, that's all I am. I am your unworthy servant. I don't deserve to be called by your name. I don't deserve to be your servant, but I will gladly serve you with all I have. I love you. I love the master and I want to serve him with my whole life. Do you see how the parable does that? He tells these stories, it gets past your defenses and it brings emotions. This is unfair. God is unfair. He's mean. He's a slave driver. Or it's all a gift. It's all grace. And I am nothing but your unworthy servant. Thank you, Lord. It's a story by R.A. Torrey, who was a pastor and writer in the 19th and 20th century in his book, The Power of Prayer and the Prayer of Power. He shares this letter that he received from someone in his church. Dear Mr. Torrey, I am in great perplexity. I have been praying for a long time for something that I am confident is according to God's will, but I do not get it. I have been a member of the Presbyterian Church for 30 years and have tried to be a consistent one all that time. I have been superintendent in the Sunday school for 25 years and an elder in the church for 20 years, and yet God does not answer my prayer and I cannot understand it. Can you explain it to me? And in response, R.A. Torrey says this, This man thinks that because he has been a consistent church member for 30 years, a faithful Sunday school superintendent for 25 years, and an elder in the church for 20 years, that God is under obligation to answer his prayer. He is really praying in his own name. And God will not hear our prayers 
when we approach him in that way. You hear that? Read that again. He's really praying in his own name, and God will not hear our prayers when we approach him in that way. We must, if we would have God answer our prayers, give up any thought that we have any claims upon God. There is not one of us who deserves anything from God. I'd never even considered that expression before, praying in our own name, but it makes sense. He's saying we're coming to, coming to God on the basis of our own merit, on the basis of what we have done, saying, God, you owe me because of what I have done. He says that's praying in our name, and God's not going to answer prayers in our name. He says he answers prayers in Jesus' name where we come and say, God, I deserve nothing, but I ask on the basis of Jesus on what he has done, on his death for me. That's what I ask on. I ask in Jesus' name. This is the problem sometimes when a church or a pastor or an author overemphasizes the love and favor of God and deemphasizes the holiness of God and our own sin, right? When you get those things out of balance and you just talk about the love and favor of God constantly and don't talk about the holiness of God or our own sin, then we begin to think that we are special and we are so special that God owes us. And when God does not answer our prayers or come through the way we think you should, we say, God, you're unfair. I thought you loved me. I thought your favor was on me. How come you don't answer my prayers? How come you don't heal me? How come you don't come through? Because we've forgotten that God is a holy God who owes us nothing. We are but unworthy servants who come asking in Jesus' name. And he owes us nothing. And if he chooses to answer our prayers, praise be to God. And if he chooses not to answer our prayers, praise be to God. He is still good. He still loves us. He still knows what is best for us. We're not going to pray in our own name. We're not going to come to him thinking that he owes us, that he's unfair if he does not answer our prayers. All we have deserved is death, and God has given us eternal life. To quote J.I. Packer, who passed away this week, in the New Testament, grace means God's love in action towards people who merited the opposite of love. Grace means God moving heaven and earth to save sinners who could not lift a finger to save themselves. Grace means God sending his only son to the cross to descend into hell so that we guilty ones might be reconciled to God and received into heaven. Or as Paul put it, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things to him. Be the glory forever. Amen. 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 Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? This parable Again, it might have a very simple lesson. Jesus could have just come out and said, hey, Peter, I know you're asking me, what's my reward going to be for serving you all these long years? But I want you to know that everyone who comes to me, whether it's a five-year-old or as a 95-year-old, the reward is eternal life. It's a gift. It's a denarius. It's more than you deserve. But he doesn't just tell it that way. He tells it in this parable in a way that it sneaks past our defenses and reveals the attitude of our heart. What we feel about salvation, what we feel about the life of faith, and what we feel about God. So let me ask you one last time before I close. Are you a worker? Do you see yourself as a worker to whom God owes blessing and reward for your labors? Or do you see yourself as someone who is separated from God, in need and with nothing to offer, but nevertheless, you were chosen by the God of the universe and blessed even though you don't deserve it. Is your service to God a chore while you envy those who do not follow him? Or is knowing and serving God the highest joy and privilege of your life? And lastly, is God a boss who owes you results for your labor, answers for every prayer? Or is he a loving and merciful father who has saved you, chosen you, adopted you, died for you, to whom you owe everything and to whom you'll joyfully give everything you have in service to him? That's the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Amen.